chat's pit number go up. So again, welcome to everyone. We are live on YouTube. I'm going to go ahead and start the recording and we'll get started. All right, thank you everyone for joining us for the webinar today, the third mode bonus chapters, progress in walking, bicycling, and micro mobility for transportation. My name is Candace Gallagher and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 223rd webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. And a side note that I know Jeff will probably um, expand on is that his first webinar back um, with us was discussing the same topic back in 2012, um, only a year after we started hosting webinars. So a decade later, I am excited to see what he shares um, after a decade of progress. So um, as some notes that you'll see on the screen, this webinar is being recorded. It includes real-time closed captioning in English and also offers free learning credits. And you will see a link to the uh, learning credit quiz and the survey in the chat box. And you can also turn on captions by clicking the caption uh, CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And attendees will receive a follow-up email from me within two days following the webinar that will include a link to the recording, the transcript, the resources slide with the presenter email, as well as learning credit details. And I want to thank our webinar partners today that include Visit Long Beach Peninsula, uh, as well as the Professional Trail Builders Association and our federal agency partners that include the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, and the USDA Forest Service. And I want to um, introduce our presenter for today. We have Jeff, uh, Jeff Olson, who is the co-founder of Recharge E. Um, and I'm excited to pass controls over to uh, Jeff to get started. Thank you so much, Candace, and, and thanks to everyone at American Trails and all the people that are that are joining us today who are helping to make change happen um, in a world that needs it, and, and trails are such an integral part uh, of the kind of change we want to see happen. Um, it's, it's a particular thrill to be back here because when uh, my book, The Third Mode, came out, uh, this was uh, one of the first public presentations we did was a webinar for American Trails, and and now here we are, you know, a, a dozen years later. Um, the central message back then and, and today, I think, remains very much the same. Uh, trail, if you've had a simple equation, trails plus people equals joy. And, uh, and having happiness in our lives is something that um, we need every day in ways that maybe we don't even fully comprehend all the time. Um, and the people part of this is such a central element of our uh, of our experience, and and I want to acknowledge a handful. Uh, that first webinar, I, I want I just went and listened to it again. It's available on the American Trails archive, and I want to thank uh, Bob Cerns, uh, who was then president of American Trails, and Andy Clark, who at that time was with League of American Bicyclists, for co-hosting that with me. And it's a great presentation to go back and re-listen to. Uh, my my business partners at, at Alta, both Alta Planning and Design and Alta Bike Share, uh, Mia Burke especially, who helped. Uh, with her book Joyride, uh, to push me to to do the same and 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 realize that writing a book would be a really fun and exciting thing to do, um, and uh, Sam Piper, who uh, started uh, as a graduate student, I taught at U Albany for about twenty years, and Sam was uh, offered a job based on his great uh, performance in the classroom and became uh, you know one of the leaders in our company, helped get the book out into the real world um, as one of his projects, and and is now at the city of Denver. And, and so many other people that and I, it would be hard to, to even begin to name them all. Uh, you can see my sort of you know background across my life, uh, both as a as a faculty member, as a professional, as you know in, a volunteer in, in the trails world. Uh, currently uh, working with World Resources Institute on their sustainability uh, program, uh, and 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 uh, helping some new things happen as well. So. Um, if you think about that 12 year time frame, and then I'm going to jump into the slides here, you know, you go back to September 12th of 2012 was the day that, that we did this webinar and it was intentionally picked um, having worked in New York city and been involved in the New York city greenways uh, program and, and ran that task force out of the world trade center, 82nd floor for five years. Um, you know, the, the date was significant and still continues to be. So, and at that time, 
You know, did we know that we were going to be at war for as many years as we were? Uh, climate change has become an even more significant daily recurrence in our lives and something that we know we have to adapt and be resilient to and, and, and fight as much as any war that's ever been fought. Uh, we just came through you know, a pandemic, uh, which was devastating around the world of the loss of a million people in our country, uh, including you know, friends and family members for, for so many of us. Um, and yet within that, this one thing that all of us are involved in, the idea of trails for transportation, for recreation, for mental and physical health, for the environment, for safety, for all the other important reasons for, for economics, uh, continues to be a, a constant. And I think that at the time I wrote the book and Candace will ask you to start, we'll go to the next slide to start moving through them. Um, at the time that, that the book came out, I honestly thought that a lot had happened and there were some really important and great stories to tell and that the telling of those stories, each of them would be impactful and would inspire people to, to think in a new way. And the, the idea of the third mode, for those of you who may not have, have read the book, was that you know, up until now, uh, up until recently, the infrastructure movement, if there is such a thing you know, in, in the US and internationally, tended to think about funding infrastructure for highways and transit, and that was it. There were basically two modes of transportation that public agencies and the private sector were involved in. And I realized fairly early on in my, uh, in my career that there was more to it than that. And, and that's what I've spent most of my life working on. And in a particular interchange uh, with a, a, a very high level official during the reauthorization of the transportation bill in 1994 or five, while I was working for New York State DOT, um, I was challenged by someone who said, look, there's only two modes of transportation. There's highways and there's transit. And that's it. What you're talking about is the third mode. There is no such thing. And that conversation stuck with me. And I realized, even though I was kind of young and not maybe forceful enough at the time to realize the power of that idea, um, it remained with me for a long time. That Yes, there's there's probably a third, a fourth, a fifth, and how, how many other modes there are. And that so many of the problems that we deal with in, in, in the world and in society are constantly being split into either or yes or no binary decisions. Everything is either black or white, rich and poor, good and bad. And we're constantly sort of playing this game of ping pong uh, without any real forward progress. And the idea of the third mode isn't just about transportation and recreation and mobility. It's about rethinking how we solve problems and how the work that we collectively do, the hundreds of people that are here on this webinar today and the thousands and millions that we get to work with um, is part of making that change happen, about thinking as uh, an entirely new way of approaching problems by saying, you know, the answer to this isn't one or the other, it's both and. It's the idea that we are going to do more things than we've done before, different things than we've done before, and they're going to make change happen. So in the original book, there were there were these 10 chapters. You can see them listed on the, on the screen here now. And um, each one of them told the, the story of a project that I was directly involved in um, that led to, at the time, what I thought was significant change. Um, and as we'll get into today, you'll realize that um, I thought that was, you know, at that point, we'd done quite a bit and that was pretty good. Um, but a lot more happened since then. And we're going to talk about those dozen, dozen years. But just to, to touch base on those original stories, and I won't go through them all, but uh, the Grand Canyon Greenway, I am so happy to say, uh, maybe some of you have heard of that project. Uh, the original project team, um, eight of the original 10, uh, just got together in November for the first time in decades um, to have all of us get to the Grand Canyon and, and see the work that was done. That project took uh, more than 20 miles of, of new greenway along the rim of the North Rim and the South Rim of the Grand Canyon, uh, connection out into Tusian, the gateway town to the South, and transformed the experience of, of being in one of our most important uh, global destinations with millions of tourists a year now able to go from overlook to overlook on foot, on bike, in wheelchairs and strollers. Um, and it was such a, uh, I, I don't even have the words to describe the, the power of that experience to see it. Um, it was a long project. It went through incredible ups and downs. You'll have to read the book to see the entire story. And, and, and then to see it there and to see that those millions of people are having that experience and the the pure joy of it, you know, whatever mode of, of mobility they were choosing to use, um, 
and, and that the park has grown in visitorship, um, a visitorship to our national parks with significant increases, and that that's hopefully, uh, I still believe, a model, uh, not just for national parks for in here in the U.S., but for places around the world, uh, that we can make that kind of change happen. Um, I just hope it can happen faster um, and more people can, can, can know about those kinds of things. Um, Jackson Hole Pathways, I was out there recently, and they're they are still making great change happen. Uh, Northwest Arkansas, the, the Razorback Greenway so far exceeded our expectations of what a big project could be. And at the time, a you know, $30 million Greenway project was a completely new thing in this country. Um, transformative, end-to-end, uh, -end, built in three years' time, uh, led to a regional open space plan, dozens of mountain bike parks, uh, transformation of downtowns along the route, hundreds of millions of dollars in investment. Um, and if you've not been to, to Bentonville to see what that looks like, I uh, urge you to, to take a look. And, and another reminder in all you know, three of those projects I just mentioned, it's the people behind them. You know, it's just, uh, in that case, the Walton Family Foundation and so many regional partners that help make that happen. Uh, Friends of Pathways in Jackson Hole and, and all the people who've contributed to that, the, the Grand Canyon Greenway team, every one of these projects you know, would, would have the, the same. So I'm not going to go through the rest of the projects, but they are, you know, they're they were, uh, at the time, I think important. I think that they helped inspire people to, to believe that the project that you're working on is that big, is that important, is that urgent, that it can help change the world by doing something that's local. That's something that, you know, some of them started to get a little bigger as time went on, the New York City Greenway system. And by the way, big shout out to the, to the crew at City DOT today. Uh, this is uh, your brown bag lunch presentation, and uh, I think there's dozens of folks at the agency. Uh, and and thanks to all of you for the great work that that you've done, and it's been great to collaborate, you know, over so many years. So, you know, those were the initial stories. I mean, we thought maybe at that point, you know, that early American Trails webinar had, um, you know, made some positive steps forward. And I, I don't think even then I could have imagined what the next decade was about to bring. And probably one of these days, it's time to to write another book. But since I haven't done that yet. What I'm going to do today is share uh, three stories that have come out of the time since, uh, all of which took place, you know, after that that moment in 2012. So, uh, next slide, please, and we'll jump into that those that next series of stories. So, you know, just after 2012, my business partners at Alta Planning and Design um, had our annual meeting. Um, we thought, uh, and I, I really thank Mia for this. Our a uh, couple of us are tennis players and thought we would go to the Palm Springs uh, tennis tournament and see Rafa Nadal play in person. We thought that was about the biggest success we could dream of. And, and while we were there, uh, our, our founder, Michael Jones, had this brilliant idea that we should start a bike share company. Um, bear in mind, we were a bunch of planners and architects and engineers and a couple of economists um, who had not ever operated anything like that. And for that matter, nor had anyone else, uh, certainly in North America. There were a few good examples around the world at that time, uh, Paris, Barcelona, Montreal, uh, but the idea of shared mobility at large scale in cities um, was an extremely new thing at, at that point in time. Um, I don't think that we could have possibly imagined the change that that was going to lead to and, and what was going to occur in, that, in the five years that would follow from that day. Uh, we did find found that new company uh, in very quick order. We ended up winning the bid for the bike share system in Melbourne, Australia. Um, that's a story in and of itself <laughs> and uh, pretty remarkable accomplishment there. Um, and that was followed quickly by a bid for the bike share in Washington, D.C., which we also won. And all of a sudden we started to be seen as the global experts in this stuff. Um, and bear in mind, we were as new to it as anyone else. Uh, D.C. was followed by Boston and Cambridge and Massachusetts. Um, we had for the first time sponsorship that came in uh, as part of that project with uh, New Balance as our as our title sponsor, along with the uh, hospital system in Boston and um, a couple of the universities that contributed, Harvard, MIT. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, now we start getting more bids come in and we win, uh, we win Chattanooga, Tennessee, and almost simultaneously, we win New York and Chicago. Um, and all of a sudden, we're one of the biggest bike share companies uh, really in the world. Uh, the thing that probably changed that the most, though, was something we had never imagined. And I I mentioned earlier the Razorback Greenway being a $30 million project at the time. Um, Citibank comes forward and a pretty likely sponsorship. Now that you look back and see that blue bike on the screen, it makes so much sense, right? Uh, but I can tell you I was part of a lot of pitches to others that, that didn't quite uh, think it sounded as good. 
Uh, tremendous leadership from Mayor Bloomberg and the entire team. Uh, City DOT was invaluable to making this happen. Uh, and, and the bank uh, and their team was, was just absolutely amazing. You do see on the screen City Bike number one. And that was a, uh, a particularly magic moment. We're at City Hall with the mayor and the leaders of, of, of the bank and all these others. And Citibank announces a $42 million corporate sponsorship for a bike project. Um, there had not been anything like that in, in the world that we worked in. You know, Grand Canyon Greenway, we'd raised some millions of dollars, you know, single digit millions. We thought that was heroic, right? All of a sudden, we've got, you know, one of the biggest corporations in the world is in the middle of what, what we are about to do. And uh, it is a tremendous roller coaster ride. I don't have enough time in today's webinar to tell uh, the entire story. Um, and again, maybe this is a topic for another book that hasn't been written yet. Uh, but we went from a company that was, as I mentioned, just started with, uh, you know, six of us sitting around a table in California. And a year later, we're operating these large scale bike share, bike share systems. We went from zero to 500 full time employees in a matter of, of just a few years. Uh, we ended up operating 30 million rods in that five year period with zero fatalities. I mean, really a, a sea change in the visibility of our movement. Um, you know, not quite the same as sort of, you know, dirt trails. And believe me, I spent a lot of time uh, out on, on trails like that as well. This is a you know, much more urban story. Although if you want to have some fun and go to the City Bike Boys on, on YouTube, you'll find a really fun channel of people doing all kinds of things on those bikes still. Um, we did end up selling the company after five years to a group of investors who uh, later sold it to Lyft. So, uh, you know, you start to be playing in a much, much bigger field and, Things happen that are um, pretty high risk, uh, but high reward. Uh, I think the one part of the story that that I will want to talk about today, because it, I hope it gets people to think about, you know, there are some difficult days when you're doing things and any project goes through that, whether it was Grand Canyon Greenway or the Razorback or Jackson Hole or any of the others, Dubai, uh, projects we worked on all over the world. And, and there are days where you just think, you know, we're not going to make it, right? So for us, that moment came um, after the announcement of all those big launches, and we were basically launching uh, Chicago and, and Chattanooga and New York City pretty much at the same time, uh, pretty unprecedented scale uh, of, of this in an entirely new industry. Uh, there were some significant technical problems with the uh, provider of technology that made the bikes and the stations. Um, that's all very well-known news, and, and you can read quite a bit about, it, about that. Um, but, you know, we were the prime contract and we we're buying bikes and stations for them. We had to fix those problems. Uh, the city gave us a roughly six month uh, term in which to work out of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And we were able to get a warehouse facility there set up so we could do product testing and system testing and make sure that everything worked before a scheduled launch at the end of October. And um, for those of you who remember what happened in those years, um, about two or three days before that next launch, the, the, the delayed launch was supposed to happen. Uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, of course, being on the New York City waterfront, uh, we get hurt, hit by Superstorm Sandy. So climate change comes directly to home. Uh, we are forced to deal with uh, the largest storm to hit the New York City metro area, uh, pretty much in the city's history. Uh, you know, close to a dozen feet of seawater, salt water, through our warehouse destroys the entire system. Um, and I, I can tell you that those were not exactly the best days of our lives that uh, we had. Uh, and, and thankfully our team, uh, uh, heroic effort by, by everyone involved um, to salvage an extremely, extremely challenging situation for the city, for us, for everyone involved. Um, and six months later, uh, we actually get to launch City Bike. Uh, we launched the bike share system in Chicago. Uh, we survive all of that and we go from, you know, from probably, I think most of us involved would say the lowest day of our professional careers um, happening in October uh, to a year later, we, we sell the company and everybody kind of walks away happy. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to talk about it with 12 years perspective. There are large parts of the story that I, I probably glossed over uh, uh, maybe more quickly than I should, should. There are so many in people involved that make some of these things happen. But I will just tell one anecdote uh, because I, um, as, I'm, as we're all looking at the screen at bike 0001, uh, the lead person from the team that was going to buy our company and I decided that we would, um, we would do the five borough bike tour in New York City on city bikes. 
Um, I had actually done it one year previously on a blacked out, you know, bike with no logo on it before we had the sponsorship deal. It was actually a bike that was uh, uh, black from, from, from London, England, similar tech, similar system. And, um, but people recognized it right away. It was really interesting how many people during the day were like, wow, is that one of those new bike share bikes? But by the time we get to city bike and, and it's everybody's media darling, um, I did not have this particular bike with me that day, but um, our investor and I are riding and we're you know up through lower Manhattan and you're riding. It's just so wonderful. And people are asking us a lot of questions along the way, like, so how do you pay out overage charges? You're going to have a bike all day. How does that work? Um, and he was interested by how curious people were about you know, the, the depth of inside information about this stuff. And as we're riding through Central Park, uh, a group comes up next to us and says, hey, um, we've got an Instagram group and we are trying to ride the lowest serial numbered bike that we can find in the system. And this guy's like, I just found bike number two. Uh, 0002 just a couple weeks ago, but nobody's ever seen bike number 001. And they don't know that I know the answer to this question. And the guy who's riding with me is like, God, people are really into this stuff. You know, this is a level of depth they weren't expecting. And of course, I couldn't answer the question. You know, I, I, I certainly knew at that point that bike number one was in the mayor's office and uh, I, I knew where it was. Uh, but just a very funny story and a, and a sort of small way of seeing the bigger picture of the change that happened and that uh, bike share around the country. We had great sponsorship from from Ford in San Francisco. And I mentioned New Balance in, in Boston and 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 all kinds of support like that. But it kind of became like copiers and everyone just called it Xerox. And I still get people sending me photos from all over the world. Look, I was on a city bike in Barcelona or, uh, you know, I just saw this here and and it really became a game changing, scale creating, uh, movement making effort that could not have happened had not those all those circumstances come together. Had the cities at the time not started to make the major investments of the greenways and on street systems that made it possible uh, to be able to ride safer. We have a long way to go with this, and I'll, and I'll you know as I get to this part of the the story, I just want to make sure we know that even with all we've accomplished at this point. The numbers have to grow if we're going to reach the level of change that we need to address any of, of the carbon changes we need to make, the, the climate change reductions, the health, both mental and physical, that we need to improve uh, local economies, jobs, all that. Um, every one of these things that we talk about has to be 10, 20, 100 times bigger. And these are just stories that help us you know, try to get there. Uh, when you get to the resources at the end, I hope you all get a chance to click on one of my favorite media coverages that we had of the entire bike share story uh, right when we were at our lowest point and we had just launched the system and there's still all kinds of problems happening and everybody's complaining about just about everything. Uh, we got attacked uh, pretty viciously by the Wall Street Journal uh, on their media channel. Uh, one of their editors, actually a board member, a Pulitzer Prize winner, um, really tore us apart. That bike share was part of a, you know, totalitarian regime taking over the city and you know, we got involved in, in some really ugly media. And right after that, uh, The Daily Show, and a huge shout out to John Stewart. If anybody can ever thank him for me personally, uh, The Daily Show ran an episode called Full, Pe Full Pedal Racket uh, that took that down and made the entire story funny. And everyone just saw the humor in it. And within days, we had DiCaprio out riding a city bike and, and uh, J-Lo was riding one. And pretty soon every celebrity, you know, Paul McCartney gave us a shout out on, on Saturday Night Live. So um, that that's a longstanding thank you for me. And that link to the Daily Show episode is, is in the resources at the end of today. So um, let me go to the next one. Um, and I'm going to tell, start telling the next story um, as we go along. So, you know, I mentioned a couple of projects that were in the tens of millions of dollars and we we're starting to maybe see uh, Money is not certainly not the way to measure success in these projects, but but that the scale and demand of what's trying to be achieved um, requires some resources to get it to happen. And um, this next story is one that's closer to home, uh, even for me. Um, I, I live in Saratoga Springs, New York, sort of the at the X of the map where, where these major corridors come together here in New York State. And um, myself and many many others had dreamed for years of the idea of creating a, a, a trail across New York State end to end. Uh, there'd been uh, a lot of great work that's gone on, organizations like Parks and Trails New York, the New York State Canal Corporation, State DOT, where I, I was a former employer, 
um, had had worked for many, many years to try to connect the Erie Canal Trail across New York State. Uh, the old Penn Central Railroad, when it was abandoned, uh, had been acquired by state parks uh, in a visionary effort that took place in the 1970s um, and predates even you know, most of the rail trail work is, that was done later in this country. Um, my firm at the time, uh, Alta Planning and Design, was under two different projects looking at two of the most difficult questions about how to make this happen. Uh, the first was in Syracuse and uh, a 14 mile gap that we knew was gonna require many millions of dollars to solve. But even if we had the money, there were some extremely difficult technical challenges to overcome. Major railroad crossings, uh, waterfront that was a super fun site, um, uh, a state highway that was the only road uh, for, for a long way that had been built on top of the Erie Canal. It was actually called Erie Boulevard. A uh, big suburban highway with six lanes, uh, and there was no way to get around it, really. Um, and we were brought in. There was initially a design competition, and then we were brought in after that to um, figure out how do you solve that, that huge gap and what would it take to make it happen. And it was a small contract um, and, and something we worked on you know, for maybe six months. And at, at the same time, in parallel, we got approached by a New York State agency called Hudson River Greenway, uh, that wanted to answer um, how a, a trail could be connected from New York to Albany, which had been part of their original directive by our state legislature in the 1990s, but had not been accomplished. So we have those two projects going on, and I was involved in, in, in leading both of them. And we start to get to the point where we're thinking we actually could figure both of these things out. Uh, the key to the Hudson Valley solution was to crisscross the river using a couple uh, points where uh, the, the huge walkway over the Hudson Bridge project, if some of you have heard of that, one of the longest pedestrian spans uh, in the United States right now, um, had been converted from an old railroad bridge in, into a, a, a state park, a linear state park over the Hudson, a spectacular destination. That made it possible for us to be able to, to connect together major trail projects on both the east and the west side of the river, but still create a continuous route uh, from Albany to New York City. But of course, you know, tens and tens of millions of dollars to make that happen. And then the Syracuse project started to come together as we started to see the pieces of that being possible. But again, you know, lots of money to make that happen and some pretty big gaps in between. We had a, a utility corridor south of Albany for more than 30 miles that um, was owned by a, a power company and did not want a trail on it. We had the New York City MTA owning 20 plus miles in the lower Hudson Valley. Uh, and they insisted it had to stay, you know, as track and could not become a rail trail. And some of these battles have been going on literally for, for decades. Um, we got approached through the Greenway though, uh, uh, by a request from the governor's office. They were looking for projects uh, for the New York State of the State Address, which takes place in January each year. Um, and uh, then Governor Cuomo, and we won't go into Governor Cuomo's too, story too much here, um, but you know he did believe in these big infrastructure projects and, and was a potential ally and, um, we put together a proposal that said, what if we tie together finishing not just the Hudson River Valley Greenway, but if we connected up that with the Erie Canal Trail work, close that big gap in Syracuse, and then extended the trail north um, with a combination of on and off-road trail uh, all the way to the Canadian border, we could create a 750-mile interconnected system, tie it into Amtrak, make it possible to access from the MTA, Every community would get projects that, that they'd been trying to finish for a long time. And if we had the executive level support from the state of New York, we could kind of cut through and, and solve some of these really challenging problems, but not insurmountable ones. Um, it was a pretty fast moving thing that happened uh, that winter. Um, and this is just before the pandemic hits. So we're in 2019. Uh, we get this big announcement and we get $200 million in the New York state budget as a line item project. Uh, to uh, create what's been called the Empire State Trail. And the governor makes that announcement. Um, if any of you have been around these things at times, uh, maybe you'll appreciate, I'll, I'll tell a quick side story here. Uh, the day of the announcement, uh, Lindsay Zefting, uh, who uh, became a principal at Alta um, and now has her own firm, and I were uh, you know, sort of the, the lead people. She spent a month on speed dial with, with high-level executives uh, we were invited by the state parks commissioner to come hear the state of the state address, but it was at a location about three hours from where we lived. And we had to drive to that place, you know, early in the morning to get there at a certain time. And uh, we got there and we weren't even on the security list. So there was a whole problem of 
they didn't have seats for us and they weren't going to let us in. And the last minute they finally do that. And we get in and I get a text message from someone pretty close to what was being announced that day said, not going to happen today. So I've just been up since five o'clock in the morning. I'm in my seat and uh, get told by somebody, no, it's not going to happen. You know, and you know, the way these things go, sometimes high level folks, uh, um, you know, they've got 10 things and they're going to announce three of them. And you just, you know, you don't always know, even if you've been directly involved in it for a couple months at that point. And sure enough, you know, the presentation starts and about five or six minutes into it, up comes Empire State Trail on, on the giant screen and the governor makes the announcement and, and talks about the money and, you know, we're going to get this done and says, we're going to do this in three years. Um, you can imagine the sort of audible gasp from some of us when the idea of finishing that much work in that many places with that level of degree of difficulty in a three-year time period was a pretty shocking thought. And we were just, wow, I guess that's, you know, the political view of these things happens in election cycles and we got to roll up our sleeves and get to work. Um, thanks to a number of organizations that, that helped to advocate for this project at the state legislature level, that member or line item was in the, in the state budget, the governor's budget that year, money started to flow through to the state agencies and we got hit by a pandemic. So just when we thought like, oh, this stuff is gonna go so great. Um, it is an amazing uh, accomplishment at a level I can't even begin to describe uh, that more than 55 separate capital projects at different locations spread out over 750 miles during a pandemic, we're all built on time and on budget. Uh, we knew when we started that the initial $200 million was not going to complete the entire thing. Um, but we also knew that we had access to some matching funds and some other sources and some private donations. Uh, since the bills are in the playoffs, I'll shout out to the Ralph Wilson Family Foundation, uh, which when the team was sold, uh, they were the original owners of the bills. Ralph Wilson left uh, the, his fortune from selling the team. Uh, $600 million to New York State, uh, to Western New York State, and $600 mile, million dollars to Greater uh, Buffalo. And a chunk of that money went into uh, some beautiful new trailheads and, and sections um, and a new greenway plan for Western New York that came out of that work. Um, so a $300 million total uh, came in at like $299.99, uh, finished during the pandemic uh, in, in record time. A uh, project of a scale that, that many of us will never have to deal with anything quite that complicated, let alone dozens of them all at the same time, multiple state agencies, dozens of different contractors involved. Uh, one of the smart things we did at the very beginning uh, was to do a design manual that, that's still available. You can download it online um, and a, master, a quick master plan document that showed the entire thing and made it very public, easier for people to see and share especially as we entered into a period where we were suddenly doing things long distance and not able to attend meetings. Um, all of those projects got done. And I want to describe just a couple of them because they collectively represent, as I said, some of the most difficult situations you're going to come into. So the 14-mile the gap in Syracuse, which ended up costing, um, I wouldn't say cost is the wrong word. It was an investment. Um, it really is an investment um, and, and a great one at that. Um, involved, um, if I go from uh, east to west uh, across the state, uh, the first section was a new bridge over an interstate highway, followed by a road conversion that includes the original towpath of the original Erie Canal. Towpath Road was turned into a one-way road uh, for more than a mile with a two-way bikeway using the, the what would have been the other lane uh, for motorized traffic. Uh, that then connects onto Erie Boulevard, uh, which for several miles with a state highway uh, converted from six lanes to four uh, road diet with a two way bikeway walkway down the center in the median. A nearly impossible project that every single day of the week for a month, state DOT told us why it would never happen and couldn't be done. And we just kept saying to them, give us 24 hours to respond to your concerns. We'll work on this overnight and get back to you. And we did that every single day. Because if we couldn't get that project to happen, it, the whole thing was going to be a big problem. Uh, and we weren't going to be able to get around that, that challenge. Um, so we get that project. State DOT ends up building that. It was a $45 million project. And they highlighted it as one of the great accomplishments the agency has done. So um, I've always said that the, you know, the three stages of any great idea are, are total opposition, grudging acceptance by the opposition, 
followed by the opposition claiming it was their idea in the first place. And that's, that's a probably pretty good example of that. And just a, they, were, they were great to work with. They did amazing stuff to get that project to happen. Uh, that then connects through the, uh, the city of Syracuse uh, on-street network, which includes a whole bunch of new green lanes and pedestrian improvements, the Onondaga Creek Walk, which is connected down to the lakefront, uh, and then a bridge that spans over all of the major east-west railroad lines crossing central New York state, which includes Amtrak, CSX, and others. Uh, the bridge section is more than a thousand feet long. Uh, Onondaga County led that project. It was millions of dollars, had faced tremendous opposition for many, many years, uh, and got done during that same period of time. Where that bridge lands along Onondaga Lake was a super fun site, as I mentioned earlier, uh, extremely complicated environmental issues due to uh, toxins from the World War II weapons buildup, uh, which included weapons, uh, you know, nuclear and others, um, and, and Lockheed Martin and National Lead and other big companies. Honeywell now controls most of that site. And as part of their work and finishing uh, reconstructing that site, the trail was extended through the New York State Fairgrounds from the lake. Uh, the first time that the fairgrounds lands have been open to the public on a year-round basis uh, in, in most people's memory, uh, that is open. You can now ride or walk through, through the fairgrounds through the Honeywell site where they built miles of new trail and extends through to one of the original Erie Canal locks, which has been restored on the western edge of that section. And that's just 14 miles out of the 750. Uh, bear in mind, a lot of the trail segments were, were already out there, had been connected over the years. This was sort of a giant connect the dots project of filling in these nearly impossible gaps that most people said that's never gonna happen in our lifetime. And, and yet somehow we, we did make it so. Um, there's a story like that for every one of these pieces, and I know there's folks on the call here today who've been involved in so many uh, of, the, of these efforts, but you know, at the end of that is that you come up to, you know, here in New York State, my home state, we did something that is absolutely heroic. Uh, I think other states are certainly working on similar things in other countries. Um, I wouldn't say that we've matched the level of, say, the Eurovel network in Europe or uh, you know, some of the great greenway projects that we're seeing happen all around the world, uh, cities in China that are being de designed as greenway cities and projects that are happening on, on every continent, in India, in Africa, in, in South America. Um, and, and really what we're seeing is the scale of this global movement continuing to grow. Um, I've often said with the East Coast Greenway, many of you, I hope, know that project and support it, uh, that it will be the first billion dollar greenway. We've gotten into the hundreds of millions the billion dollar projects uh, can't be that far away. But the only way we're going to get there is by collectively organizing and raising our voices and believing that these ideas are not something that we should sit quietly about and just and, and wish they're going to happen. Uh, but the, the, the fight to make them happen is worthwhile. As difficult as it seems, as complicated as it might uh, at times be, that the effort to make these things happen is the reward. Um, and every single time I've been fortunate enough to ride uh, the Empire State Trail, you know, across its length, uh, and each trip has been just such happiness. Uh, and you see people and meet people from all over the world that are out there traveling and loving it. And, and in every community, there's now, you know, there's a coffee shop or a pizza place or uh, a microbrewery that you can stop at, uh, homestays at, through Airbnb. And the experience of it is just fantastic. And you know, I hope that this is an inspiration for, for other projects like it all over the world. So I'll go to our third story, and then we're going to take uh, some question and answer time. Um, and that's uh, a new one. So uh, I got asked at the end of the last webinar 12 years ago, I think one of the better questions I've been asked, and this was 12 years ago, if this stuff is so difficult, why do you keep doing it? And um, it's one of those questions yet you keep asking yourself all the time, you know, if it was easy, somebody else would have done it. That, that's that's probably the quick answer. But there's always something new. There's always another challenge. There's always this next thing um, that I think drives success. It becomes the thing that when you make it happen, it's its own reward. You know, and I've been in this, this is sort of a New York centric presentation today because it is my home and 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 I like to I like to help promote it. Uh, but there are projects like this that I've been involved in and others have been involved in, you know, really all over the world that could be telling those similar challenges and those similar successes. And I, I think that's why this is important is that everyone's going through this and collectively we can actually go through it better. So in the middle of the bike share and Empire State part of, Empire State Trail part of my life, uh, by the way, I thought I was slowing down. You know, we had two companies, uh, Alta Plan and Design, 
grew from a handful to, to a couple hundred people and dozens of offices. Our bike share company, as I said, had grown to you know most of the major cities in North America and had 30 million trips and 500 employees. I'd been on the faculty at State University of New York uh, 20 years and more than a thousand students who are, uh, many of them were out there, uh, hopefully even on this video today um, and, and doing great things. But I, I thought I was going to kind of downshift a little bit and uh, spend some more time riding my bike and skiing and do some other fun things. And yet the opportunities keep coming. And um, this one in particular, I think, is a wonderful story for all of us today to think about what's next. So in the middle of the sort of city bike era, I get approached by a French PhD wind energy physicist, uh, Julian Bouget, who says to me, what you're doing is great, but it's all going to be electric. Um, and I think I know how to charge the batteries. And right away, we struck up a great friendship, what's become a great business partnership. Uh, we see the, succeeded in getting some startup money through uh, New York State Energy Research Authority, NYSERDA, um, and developing a new company that we incorporated just a, a couple of years ago, also during the pandemic, uh, that will develop networks of wireless charging stations that can adapt universally to any bike, scooter, wheelchair, or other device being used um, in public space. And I know that the electric vehicles are gonna be an issue um, as we talk about access into wilderness and, and access into natural surface trails. Um, and it's a, an important one. I know American Trails had a recent webinar about it and it's certainly one we're well aware of. But when you think about the urban environments and the ability of more and more people to be able to get out and move around more quickly, more efficiently using electric mobility, uh, what, what Julian first approached me and recharges premise is absolutely right. Right now, if you look at the industry and there's a lot of challenges going on and, and companies that are really struggling and failing, um, most of them didn't think about the problem of how to solve charging the batteries. Because if you look at the scooter companies that are out there, for example, and many of the bike companies, they're driving cars and trucks around to swap the batteries out. And that in itself is not environmentally sustainable it kind of takes away the carbon benefit of people walking and, or riding and, and using scooters instead. Um, and, and our solution, which is new, this is a, as I mentioned, it's a startup. We're just in, you know, in a, in a fundraising round now and, and trying to get this idea off the ground um, and, and starting to work with partners in, in various places, um, just keeps that idea of something new that can change things at a bigger scale. And when we look at the, you know, the great bike cities of the world of Copenhagen, Amsterdam, uh, Shanghai, Singapore, uh, 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 Bogota, Colombia, travel around the world. Um, and there are great places doing great things. Uh, in some of those places, London even now, um, uh, bicycling has hit 25% of, of travel uh, citywide. Um, we have a long way to go in, in the United States to catch up to that. And that growth could be 20 or 30 times the level we're at right now. One of the things that will change that is the ease of using electrics. Um, they make great sense in cities. They're gonna solve problems like the hills in San Francisco or the, the heat in Dallas. Um, we are faced with um, climate change that is, is causing tremendous problems in so many places right now, heat being one of our biggest threats to, to public safety and public health. And if people can get around in a way that's, that's easier to do, uh, that's fun, uh, that, that fits the footprint of, of rapidly growing cities. And uh, if you bear in mind that, that globally right now, 60% of the world's population, close to 60% is urban. We passed the 50% mark. We're on the way to 60. Um, people are going to live in large cities, many of which are growing so fast. But at the same time, you know, from the perspective of the third mode, this is not what we're funding. No different than we haven't funded greenways and trails or walking and biking uh, and, and hiking as much as we should. Uh, if you look at the current infrastructure bill, which so many people talk about as a great environmental success, uh, there's six and a half billion dollars in there for electric vehicle, vehicle charging. The amount that's in there for charging for bikes and scooters and wheelchairs is zero, none. And that's because we are not a powerful lobby. Um, if you wanna charge your Tesla or you wanna charge your Ford or your Volkswagen, or whatever car that's, that you're driving around out there, there is a program that funds the installation, the utility cost, uh, and the devices, the charging stations themselves. All the car charging companies have to do is put the thing on the ground and operate it and sell electricity. Uh, that advantage does not exist in a level, level playing field uh, for devices that are not four wheels with motors in them. 
And I think that's a big missed opportunity, obviously. I mean, I, I have a, a clear interest in seeing that, but that's a big opportunity being missed for, for cities and for creating a market that would allow people to choose how they want to get around in the most efficient way possible. And as we look at issues about equity in mobility, um, electric cars are not going to solve that problem for the vast majority. Most people do not own a car, uh, a house, a car, or a place to plug it in, um, or live in a place where that's going to be readily possible. I know there are lots of companies working on that using those subsidies, but most people have direct access to a place where they could ride a bike, use a scooter, get around using electricity. The amount of electricity that char costs to charge a single car is the amount of electricity we could be using to charge 150 to 200 bikes and scooters. So the question we have to all ask, do we want to make hundreds of people mobile or individuals who are driving electric cars? And I hope that's a both answer. I, I'm not saying it's necessarily one or the other, but boy, if we could do 150 times more access to people who are living in food deserts, who don't have access to jobs, who can't get to school, who, who need that mobility in their lives, that is an investment that is, that is very worthwhile. But it's a very third world mode kind of problem. you know. And, and I think the problems I started trying to solve and when I wrote the book that I thought I was going to be addressing are still going on. You know, if those of you still want to pick up a copy of the book, there's a link for it at the end. Uh, it's it's available on Kindle. The ideas behind it, I think, still make a lot of sense. And I think maybe 12 years perspective um, in these stories and the others that have happened in that period of time, uh, as we really act locally and think globally, uh, I hope can make a difference. I hope can be, be an inspiration. So let me pause at that point. I know we're going to do some chat and some Q&A. If there's a question I don't get to today, you'll have my email address. Um, just keep asking the central question. My alma mater, Rensselaer Polytechnic, you know, our slogan is why not change the world? And I can tell you that I never imagined I'd be in a photo like the one you're seeing right now uh, when I was working on the Millennium Trails program. That was our launch event. Um, some truly extraordinary people to have worked with. The little girl that I'm holding right there is now about to turn 30. That's my, my daughter. And, uh, and, and I have a second and a third child as well. Uh, those children are now all in their 20s and, and living, living their lives. Um, at that young age, I didn't think I'd ever be standing next to the First Lady of the United States or the, you know, the other folks that are in that picture and, and working on something you know, of such importance. And I hope there are many of us today that are on this call thinking about something you really want to make happen and be inspired to do it. Take that risk. Take the action. You never know. It might be the next big thing. And, and that's what's going to change the world. All right, so let's go to Q&A. Candice, you're going to moderate for us, please. Awesome. Yep. First question as I change over to the live Q&A slide with your email on it, Jeff. Um, Matt's asking, what was the name of the FEMA Superfund site again? Oh, the, uh, the Onondaga Lake site in Syracuse. And they've got a visitor center there. Uh, they've built a new amphitheater there. The landscape they create uses a lot of um, bioremediation and is a really, really interesting place. And the Empire State Trail now runs right through it. So go take a look at the Onondaga Lake shorefront in Syracuse. Great. Awesome. Jeff says, um, Jeff says, you, Jeff, are, are inspiring as always. Will the third mode be updated with a new edition? You know, I, I'm, I'm really happy to get that question. I, I think the answer to that should be I, I probably need to make the effort and do it. Um, I, I, I like the idea and I, and I think it's maybe something really worth thinking of. By the way, if it's the Jeff that I'm thinking of, who might be from the Hudson Valley and uh, I believe teaches uh, still teaches a class that uses this as a text and has asked me to join their their uh, class again uh, by video this semester. Uh, we used a, a question about how would the third mode apply in your life for students? And one of the best answers I've ever heard was somebody, uh, and might have been Jeff himself, watching a third mode sun, sunset, which means watching it facing the other way. That what does the sunset look like when you're looking east and watching the sky turn color in the other direction? And a uh, great example of just thinking outside the box, uh, thinking in the third mode. So Jeff, if that was you, thanks for that. I haven't forgotten. Great. Uh, Allison says uh, the group in uh, New York with DOT, a question from Catherine, how do we balance grid capacity issues with the growth of multimodal electric mobility? Uh, that's a great question. And thanks for getting that group together uh, in, in New York today. Um, well, I think part of the answer is these smaller scale electrics, the, the bikes, the scooters, the wheelchairs, the, the, the other devices that, that provide that urban mobility, as opposed to just one person in a car at a time. Uh, it, electric buses require substations to get charged 
and and the grid doesn't have the resiliency or the power supply. Uh, most of those projects require grid upgrades. What we're talking about to charge a bike or a scooter is the energy required in a toaster oven. <laughs> it's a it's a one ten outlet, and that kind of power exists on so many street corners and in so many places. The rapid deployment for literally millions of people of small scale electrics could happen way faster than we're going to get everybody driving a, an electric car. So my answer to that in part is to invert this and think about the small, no different than the, the challenge for space and cities, more people walking and biking uh, all by itself is a better thing that uses less space and is more energy efficient. Uh, absolutely the same thing, in my opinion, is, is true for electrics. Great question though. Great. Um, I do have one more question here. Uh, so I do invite more questions because we still have just under 10 minutes um, yeah. for live Q&A today. So a question from Katie. Micromobility holds major potential for expanding access to people with uh, disabilities. How has the disability community been involved in, pl in the planning processes for these large scale projects? This is a really great question. And um, I just had the great um, honor, I can't say it another way, of uh, some of you probably know from American Trails will know Peter Axelson and, and his company, Beneficial Designs. And if you don't, please look them up. Uh, Peter is a, an absolute force of nature and was part of our team at Grand Canyon. And we made sure that that project was a model for, for designing for people of all abilities, uh, for universal access, as Peter would say. And we did just get to go experience that firsthand. And I had the, the absolute thrill of, of being able to hike along the rim of the Grand Canyon with Peter um, and, and his perspective, you know, as, as someone who's seeing the world from, from the seat of his chair. And we got into an entire conversation about how power supply provided in public space for things like wheelchairs or scooters is going to be a, a very important thing for people who need access. Um, very similar to people who are going to have cargo bikes, for example, that they could bring their kids to school or, or go to work and, 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 and move packages or all sorts of other things. So I think it's a very, very important and central conversation, but like so much of the work that we do, we're all still at this level and all the advocacy that's happening at the, at the national levels, not just in the US, is centered around you know, cars, trucks, buses, um, the big stuff that has huge industries behind it. And I think that this is the challenge that we face is to make sure that our voices are heard um, you, know, you look at a place like uh, Disney World, to take an example, rents hundreds of, and hundreds of, of, of three-wheeled sit-down scooters. There's a, there's a waiting list to be able to get them. Uh, one of the problems is they don't have enough of them and they can't charge the batteries, right? So these are clearly the kinds of innovations. I realize there's going to be some controversy and issue as we get farther and farther outside of the built environment. Um, uh, the human built environment and we get into natural areas and wilderness where there's going to be some concern and conflict between um, especially the speed at which some electrics can move. Um, but from an accessibility standpoint, I mean, it may be the only way someone can experience these places. And I mean, I can tell you a personal story when I lived in DC and was working on the Millennium Project where I, I helped a person whose wheelchair um, had, a, had a functional problem and was stuck in the middle of the street. And I was in a restaurant looking out the window and that person was stuck there for m quite a bit of time before any, I walked outside and helped them. Hundreds of people walked right by and, and didn't. And we need to change our approach to valuing every single trip that everyone takes, whether it's with walking in a wheelchair, pushing a stroller um, and, and facilitating that mobility so that we don't all end up uh, like the move, movie WALL-E where we're sitting in a, mobile chair with a big slurpy cup and a straw you know that's that's not the way that we are going to be healthier and happier um, in spite of the challenges the world faces um, trails and and mobility by people uh, uh, at, at a human scale is really what we need to be doing great question thank you great um, a couple people from New York, uh, well, actually, actually, I'm not sure if one of them is from New York, but regarding the DOTs, the Department of Transportation, Whitney's, and I'll kind of mention both of their questions. Whitney first says, any tips for getting state DOTs to think this way? Um, and Eric says, I work for New York State DOT and was wondering why we do not promote uh, commuter trailways more. And with e-bike in mind, I find that trailways promote... Um, I find that commuter routes of alternative means should be the focus. 
What are your thoughts? My focus is thank you for thinking that. And that's, you know, this is exactly the change we're trying to help make happen. And every single person on this call, you know, pick some part of it that's important to you. It does matter. And, and the changes that you make will make a difference in spite of the fact that right now we're not front and center and everyone's thinking and we're not the number one thing that everybody is is trying to make happen. We are, you know, I, I used to say that my career was, you know, in 30 years, I spent 29 years pushing a rock up a hill. And and uh, I thought at the time of bike share that we got over the top and we were so popular. You know, that night we were on the Daily Show. I thought maybe we were, you know, it was downhill with the wind at our backs from then on, but that's not true. And it comes and goes in waves and cycles. And, and what it takes is all of us change some part of the agency you're in. Um, if, if you want to talk more specifically about some of that work, I was New York State's bike and pedestrian program manager for five years and, um, and did spend quite a bit of time trying to make that institutionalized change happen and the sort of organizational strategy parts of that, whether that's in the corporate setting, the nonprofit setting, or in government. And ultimately, we get all three to work together. So just I, I think the number one thing is believe that the change you're making is important, not just to you, but to people in generations to come. And, and you'll be rewarded by um, in quiet ways that you'll never think, you know, you're walking for me, I walk down the street and I see one of those blue bikes and it never ceases to make me smile. Uh, this afternoon after we're done, I, I'm going to get out and cross country ski on the first uh, rail trail project that I was ever involved in. It was built all by volunteers. We've had some great fresh snow. And after this webinar, I'm going to go out and get on my, on, on, out on that first trail. And I know I'm going to see somebody else out there. And, you know, that project's been there for a long, long time. And every person that enjoys it, I know, benefited from, from the hard work that it took to make that happen. So, um, you know, don't shy away from, from it because it's difficult. Um, we'll, we'll keep building this movement until it gets bigger and stronger. Um, and and that's, that's what it's all about. Great. All right. We'll do two more questions. I think the first one sure. might be a little bit quicker from uh, another Jeff. Um, would you please repeat the three phases of a project? <laughs> okay. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm probably paraphrasing others who have said similar versions of this, but to me, it was always uh, total opposition, grudging acceptance by the opposition, then the opposition claiming it was their idea in the first place. And, and I think that when you think about our role, many of us that work on these projects, um, you know, for the Empire State Trail, it was for the governor to, to cut the ribbon. It's for the, you know, when you work on something with, with Citibank or New Balance or Nike or, or the companies we work with, we wanted their corporate leaders out in front of the projects. Most people didn't know our names and don't really need to. You know, it's that quiet leadership. Um, certainly, I'll say this at this point in life, um, there are many, many other people who it's their turn to lead. And all I can do is help from behind and from the sidelines and, and, and help make those things happen. And, and I think that's a kind of leadership that, that makes a big difference. Uh, if you're in this because you want your name on something, uh, unless you're going to donate the money, it's probably not likely to, to end up happening. Most of us are, you know, quiet parts of these big projects and um, watching that transition, even from people who are very much against what you're trying to do, realizing, you know, that aha moment for them where they take ownership of it and they claim it's theirs, there's no bigger success. Great. All right. One more question then from Matt. Um, and I'm not sure if you can paraphrase, <laughs> but can you talk a little bit more about the maintenance uh, best practices for the cross state trail? You know, context is he's from Illinois working on a trail network, but in the winter, it's not clear of snow and ice. And if these trails are going to be for the tra for transportation, what agencies can and should be held responsible for the maintenance? You know, is it the state DOT? Um, if it's uh, if it's piecemeal, it's not a network. Right. And I think you know, what we build is one thing, how we take care of it and how we maintain it is another. And that's going to vary with geography. There are places where grooming the snow so people could use it in the winter is a, is a particularly good thing. And there are a lot of us that might enjoy that. Uh, we're seeing changes in technology and certainly fat tire bikes, maybe a good example of uh, year round uses that are that are changing the way trails get maintained. Um, I think there's a long, difficult set of challenges that are uh, something cross state like the Empire State Trail is largely through municipal agreements. Um, and so municipalities and counties are involved in that maintenance. Um, I think that's a, you know, possibly one way to look at it. I know people have talked about these big projects 
uh, the Katy Trail across Missouri is maintained by a single agency, you know, as a long linear state park. Um, the same is going to happen in cities where networks of mobility are, are being maintained both on street and off street and how they connect. And I don't think there's a one size fits all, you know, easy answer to that, except to say that how well it's designed will affect how well it's maintained. And we need to design for things to last. Um, and the, the resources that go into maintenance um, cannot be left to chance. There has to be a clear plan from the beginning of the project, knowing how it's going to be taken care of, because that is the difference between whether people use it uh, successfully over time or not. Awesome. So I know Candace just put up our resources page. There's a bunch of them there. You've got my, my email addresses available. Um, I'm on LinkedIn if you want to try and find me as well. And, um, you know, I will try to respond to questions as best as I can. And, and, and I, I love getting them. I, the, the, the questions that people send and the comments and the stories you're working on, if there's any importance to the session today, it's knowing that the project you're working on, your story about what you're doing needs to be told. The more people who hear the, the effort that goes into making trails happen and, and know that it's important in, in so many ways from the smallest local project, like the one I'm gonna go ski right now that was community built by volunteers to, to stuff as big as, as the Empire State Trail, um, every every trail is important. We need to raise this movement globally uh, to a scale that meets the challenges of this era. And I and I hope that there are generations that follow us that are willing to build on this uh, this catalyst, this legacy that we've we've gotten started. So thank you all for the work that you are all doing, um, and for everyone who helps to make trails happen. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, today for the presentation, Duff. Really appreciate it. Um, and this resources slide that everyone sees, uh, sees here, it will be shared in my follow-up email that I will send within two days following the webinar, along with the link to the recording and the transcript, as well as learning credit details with the quiz and the survey. Um, so thank you again to Jeff. Thank you also to our additional webinar partners that include Visit Long Beach Peninsula, the Professional Trail Builders Association, as well as the Bureau of Land Management, the National Parks Service and the U.S. Forest Service. And if you are enjoying these webinars, please consider donating as little as $5 by texting I'm for Trails to 44321. Um, I will be doing a monthly drawing for those that donate today immediately following our, our webinar um, to receive um, our Trail Boss mug that you see on the screen, as well as our Happy Trails coaster and our stickers. Um, and if you do become a sustaining monthly donor, we will automatically send you a mug as a thank you. And lastly, we hope you'll be able to join us for next week's webinar in our Advancing Trails webinar series. And as always, it will be uh, live streamed as well as um, the recording will live at our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash American Trails. So thank you again to everyone for attending. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and happy trails.